the ceiling that is the ocean surface. You could have a three-dimensional environment where you had those three ideas that you could present to an audience. That was our formula for constructing the coral reef. My son was about five, so this would have been about 98, I think, and I had not seen him a lot because of a lot of work on Bugs Life, and so I wanted to spend some time with him. I said, so let's go take a walk, and so my little five-year-old and we went, went up, and we were just going to walk down about two blocks to the park, and, and I thought, oh, I have some thought of some time, and I spent the whole walk just going, oh, stay away from the curb, don't touch that, you don't know where that's been, oh, careful from that, oh, there's a car, oh, be careful, careful, careful of that branch, you know, I just... And I just spent the whole time correcting him and overprotective and making sure he didn't get hurt. And I just remember this other part of myself watching myself going, you are just losing every opportunity. You're just missing out right now on being with present with your with your son. And I just, I couldn't stop thinking about that. I thought, geez, you know, here I am just wanting so badly to be a good father, yet I, I'm not achieving that. And so I thought, what a, what a, what a ironic dilemma. I thought, you know, uh, Fear can deny a good father from being one. And that intrigued me. And that became the missing link to putting all the pieces together for what ultimately became Finding Nemo. Okay, so you like this really panicked little chicken fish? <laughs> see Nemo swimming out all the way. Go. Just whatever comes to mind, Kathy. Whatever comes to your mind, that's what you think that character would be. Just... Shut it out. Just let it out. Oh my gosh! Nemo swimming on the sea! Yes! Yes! Happy Wrinkle. I think we'll use that. <laughs> and so he's out there swimming, and it's getting later and later. He's been asking fish after every fish. Excuse me, he's not. Have you seen my son? Have you seen him? Have you seen my son? I'm looking at my son. He's on this boat. But nobody will help him. Nobody at all. The rest of the gang are all behind Nemo. They're all going around. We gotta get you out. There's gotta be a way to get you out. And they probably put their heads out. How do we get him out? How do we get you out? Uh, no, oh, oh, I heard of something once. This is whiskey. It may not work, but it's a, I heard of a fish of a fish from another fish that did this once. It's called flush, rush, and you're out. And Nemo goes, oh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm looking for somebody, too. We can look together. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're so nice. Oh, I'm Dory. I'm Nemo. Nemo. That's a nice name. And Nemo, what? Guess what? Sea turtles. They're 150 years old. Really? Yeah. Because Sandy Plank said they're 350 years old. I just always remember looking at fish and sensing how much light went through them. So that was one of the first things I sort of threw at them. I said, can we, can we make that? What makes fish look so different um, from just a piece of plastic, basically, is that there's several layers working together with light to create this look. And for a long time, we didn't have a word for it, a phrase for it. And finally, it was just like, well, it's just like, it's like, it's like gummy bears. It's like when you put the, the you know, gummy bears, you can hold the light. And so it ended up becoming the catchphrase. We just called it the gummy effect. Father Nemo, their illumination is probably 80% this gummy substance in them. And then we just augment with surface lighting to get it to look like, you know, they've got some sort of surface on top of all that so you can read their face. Because if they're too gummy, then you can't see any detail, you can't read any expression. So it's like finding that right balance to get them to look like they're both glowy and readable at the same time. Hey, what happens if you try? 
shark into his door would release a bunch of um, sort of rust particles, uh, silt, which had settled onto that stuff, would get knocked up, and the water would get a lot murkier locally in the area, and then you see the silt kind of puff up and then settle back out. The key thing about um, doing silt and making it believable really has to do not so much with how it gets kicked up. Uh, dust also responds, and got your you smack it up a fridge, dust will kick up in the air. It has to do with how it settles out, and things slow down a lot faster in water. Water is way more viscous than air, as people know, and so when Bruce the shark knocks silt off the door or off the ground or something, um, as it is ejected into the, the into the water around him, it sort of flies in quickly, but then immediately slows down, is eased out by the water, and then gently settles out to the gravity. But once it's in the air, Bruce's tail then sort of swims by and kicks it, it also reacts to that as well. Getting track of all those dynamic interactions in the water is quite difficult to do. We spent a lot of, we tried, we spent a lot of time and attention to make that look believable. And when it's done right in a shot, suddenly that adds a whole different additional level of believability to being underwater, which is a key story point in the film. Exposure underwater has some different sort of properties than ones in air do. You typically get this fireball that goes big, goes small again, and leaves behind it a mushroom cloud of smoke that rises up through the water. Lighting also plays a huge component in connecting each one of the explosions to the ones that are local to it, so that when one of these things popped off, it would flash on all its neighbors. It would also then move them out. They pop off. They light the ones next to them and carry on and so forth, all the way through the entire set until the whole thing is like one big popcorn explosion of red and orange and yellow and horribleness. What did you think when you found out that the character had been named after you? Um, I think it's great. <laughs> I think it's, I mean, it's a little bit of a mixed bag because she's kind of a, um, she's kind of a, is it the word villain? I have played a million practical jokes on Mr. Andy Stanton and I think it's just his way of Klaus. Klaus, can you honest drooping? You know, B equals M C squared and you know as well as I do. I think you have a bad haircut, don't you? Who's there? Banana who? These three tiki heads are actual caricatures of Pixar employees. Andrew was very clear that he wanted this, uh, this shot like we've never done before in Pixar. So we use an extremely wide lens, which allowed us to get the camera really close to everything in the tank. Small space hitting very specific visual marks to tie in with a story. From a lighting perspective, uh, the shot also presents uh, a difficult challenge insofar as there are setups for inside the tank clean, inside the tank with algae, outside the tank in the air, outside the tank in the baggie, baggie moving indoors and outdoors in several sets. We use a tool called Pisces, which simulates the behavior of the fish. We would set up a bunch of basic parameters where the school would be, how fast they should swim, and then simulate and do iterations of that until we got something we liked. The number of fish that we would simulate would vary from five for a little small school in the reef to a couple thousand for some of the big hero schools and background schools. 
there's a lot of simulations where we would put a lot of fish in and then just kill the ones that were misbehaving. And so basically, hundreds of CG fish died to make this movie.